the, the freedom of bike packing. You know, you've got everything you need is on your bike. You've got no possessions as such, and you're you're free. You just go wherever wherever you want. You don't really need for anything. You don't miss much. Every time I've done a long distance bikepacking trip for multiple months or you know a good amount of time, I've always come home, you know, having lived with maybe a couple of pairs of pants, a couple of t-shirts, a pair of trousers, a pair of shorts, and I've looked at my stuff and I thought, why have I got all this stuff? And I just end up clearing it all out because you don't need it. We kind of spoil in the modern age of consumerism, and you don't need half the stuff you've got. And it, bike packing's a nice reality check sometimes on that kind of thing. It's amazing when you're on your bike, when you're bike packing, or or just cycling anywhere, but especially bike packing when you turn up on your bike and you've got all your possessions strapped to your bike. You know, it's kind of obvious that you you're travelling somewhere, and it makes you vulnerable. Or I think people's perception of you is that you're you're vulnerable but if you were if you were to walk into kind of I don't know say a gas station in the middle of nowhere in a suit in a car people wouldn't help you or wouldn't talk to you but when you turn up on a bike you're tired you're sweaty maybe a bit sunburned obviously a bit dirty probably smell a bit it's amazing how many people just come and talk to you it, it just opens you know opens you up to people in the world I think you're, you're more kind of you're part of life you're passing through the world at a slow pace and I think people respond to that. I guess bikepacking life compared to normal life is just more relaxed. There's nothing more that relaxes me than a really long bike ride. So doing a really long bike ride day upon day upon day and seeing beautiful places, getting in the fresh air, speaking to new people, it just puts you in a really good, good place in your head and your body, you're getting fitter every day, you can eat what you want, you see loads of stuff, it's wonderful. Well bikepacking racing is just basically a more miserable version of bikepacking I think. You carry less stuff, you, you don't really take any casual clothes or anything, it's just your race clothes and warm clothes and minimal sleeping gear and you just ride all day. You don't really stop and speak to people that much, although you obviously have interactions. And you basically eat, and you pedal, and you sleep. So I don't actually think that fitness is the number one kind of thing you need to train for a, a, like a race such as Tour Divide. Although it's very important. You can be really fit, but you can just be mentally weak or inefficient and these races are just about managing you know your, your body managing your fitness your food your mental state your fatigue so actually I guess it's kind of about being a master of your body rather than being super fit and not always the fastest fastest guy or the fittest guy win these events it's quite often the mentally toughest and the most organized The Tour Divide is a 2,750 mile bike ride down the length of America through the Rocky Mountains that takes in all the lost forest roads and mountain passes and dirt tracks uh, and it connects them all up uh, and you get this, this amazing off-road route which goes down the Great Divide. So yeah, so I don't, I don't really know much about the entire route. I know obviously key areas um, which I'm sure will be fine. It's all the bits you don't know that you find out I guess. That's where experience comes in. It's like everything. I'm just assuming it's going to be miserable the whole whole race. I've got all my kit accordingly. Um, in the north, there's bears quite a lot, so I'm going to try and avoid camping out too much. And if I do, I select places. Um, I've got the same information available to everyone else, uh, and I can, you know, devour it and try and learn, learn not learn every detail, but you know, be familiar with the route as much as I can, but fundamentally, 
I've got to pedal my bike up big mountains and survive the weather and nature and that's a real challenge I think that's what I quite like it feels like yeah, I'm not racing people I'm battling kind of mother nature and the earth and trying to climb over these mountains and you know I'm not used to that stuff I'm gonna stay in an airport hotel tonight, get myself together because I've not slept very much. Yeah, and then head into the mountains. stay here tonight um, my original plan but I seem to be ahead of schedule so it's only nine o'clock so we're gonna push on another 45 miles to Butts Cabin I've got some food stocked up like four Subway sandwiches and uh, chocolate milk hopefully I'll get there too late just getting some dinner a classic curve outside a supermarket This morning, um, I went to bed earlier last night. I just got tired for the first day, so had a four-hour sleep. But that meant I had to start half three, and uh, yeah, pretty hungry. There's a restaurant soon. Um, another 15 miles at Holland Lake. So I'm gonna get there, eat everything, and then Richmond Peak is awaiting. So I guess this is my first real low of the ride. So day three, and uh, woke up at 3:30. Holland Lake, which is this place apparently, let's get some breakfast. It's shut and uh, I haven't got much food or energy. It's another 30 miles to the next place to get food. So I think I've got some sweets and a few cliff bars, so it's going to be a miserable morning. Food at the start of the day, so just playing catch up. Tell you what's a tough ride. It's been peak. It's all snowy. Looks like a storm's coming in on Huckleberry Pass. Hopefully, I get down in time. Get some dinner. See that beautiful moon and stars, the mist in the valleys and the silhouettes of the hills. Well, just made the ultimate schoolboy error up Stemple Pass. I uh, followed the main road, the main dirt road, and uh, missed the turn for this little pass, which is where we're supposed to take. It was dark, and I didn't see the, the GPS. And, uh, yeah, so I climbed five miles, got nearly to the top and, and realised, so I had to turn around, come back down and start again.
so quarter to five. I'm on a uh, over the ridge, um, Lisa's Ridge. Pretty amazing. It's minus two though, not super warm. Looks feel strong today. My thousand calorie ice cream after dinner last night did the trick. morning at the start of day six I think maybe five I'm not quite sure and uh just outside Lima or Lima I think how they say it around here I stayed in town last night I had quite a big sleep um but I decided to uh kind of made the conscious decision to to back off the pace a little bit the last few days have been pretty mad and not been enjoying it that much the uh forcing myself at out at 3 a.m they're not sleeping so much, so I've decided to back it off and uh, maybe do 20, 30 miles less a day, have a few hours more sleep and hopefully make it a lot more enjoyable and a lot more viable experience. Take it off. tomorrow, big day climbing tomorrow. So it's the, what's it, the seventh morning, I think. Get into the rhythm a little bit now. So you what that's cold this morning. Got my down jacket on and my winter kit. Minus five degrees.
So it's quite low on Evan at the top of uh, Dugwati Pass. <laughs> Basin day, crossing the desert, 200 miles, and then we're across from halfway point. Loads of extra water, loads of food, um, 
the one resupply, which may or may not have food, so.
morning. This is where I just woke up. Behind the hedge. <coughs> and um yeah, it's about what's the time? 3.50 What a drag it Took forever oh, I'm so tired this morning Maybe he wasn't almost relaxing Eat myself up to the top, which can't really get going. I need a proper meal, so. Moment is ride right, 15 20 minutes, stop, have a bit to eat. And then uh, ride some more. At least I know there's a prize at the top of this. Eight miles to Brush Mountain Lodge, and hopefully the biggest stack of pancakes I've ever had. So I just left Brush Mountain Lodge and uh, in for a long day. So this is the track up to uh, up to Watershed Divide, and as you can see, it's just turned to mud. It's rained, but up high it's snow. It's Josh, Josh Cates, the leader, he left here 24 hours ago, and he's just got to the other side. So hopefully, um, hopefully there'll be some footprints to follow. Cougar looking really? right back at me. Yeah, it stayed there. Uh, I, I backed yeah, off. Like, the and we had that big storm roll through. And we Sophie out and, uh, and I came through the last day. I couldn't stand the road. I was blowing right off the road. But... Yeah, Sophie Ann getting to the top was really, really hard. And then me going down was very hard. And then everybody just gets to go in the track and it's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, Sophie Ann was going so fast. Oh well, yeah, he's out. Shoot. Yeah, because he's back in... Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. Dude, I, I only use it to call my wife in the evening and say, I'm alive, goodbye! <laughs> So what's happening, Leo? So we're just leaving Brush Mountain Lodge. Everything's going super great, and then just stuck super in great. The <laughs> really stuck. So really we're stuck. So we're heading back to Brush Mountain Lodge to clean our bikes and try to uh, wait for it to dry out a little bit, and then try again. And I guess after the mud, there's three miles of snow to hike over the mountain. <laughs> Brilliant. So the guy in first place, it took him 24 hours to cover that distance. So that's what we have to look forward to. <laughs> oh, what a brilliant route this is. <laughs> so we spent the day at Brush Mountain Lodge, and there's four of us here now. Tomorrow at 3 a.m. we're going to have a crack at this pass. I mean... <laughs> I don't know. I just... I don't think we should be going there in the rain. I don't think it's a great way to start. I don't know. Is it, is it just a... It's oh, fuck. It's snow. Jesus, look at that. That's better, but it just... Yeah, but if it's down here, right. remember this is, we're, our primary concern is getting to the snow, right. and now it's snowing here. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> Back. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, should we just wait a few more hours? We've got to wait, haven't we? What's that? We've got to wait. So 
this time staying put for a bit longer. Those are pretty nice. I love the deep, deep hey, section room. Hey, welcome to the Brush Mountain Lodge. Can we get you guys some food? <laughs> yeah, have you been here before? Are you What's the plan then, Lara? What are we going to do? Uh, it's a detour. So we have a new route that takes road basically north to south through Colorado. Um, and that should avoid the worst of the snow and the should avoid the high passes, passes. and then we'll <laughs> end up south in Chama, New Mexico and then we can link back into the tour divide route south of here but kind of yeah and then be more casual and then just do a group ride yeah. there'll be three or four yeah, of yeah. us and spend like three days through Colorado yeah. five days back on the great divide route do some camping yep. enjoy meals not just shoving the gas station food <laughs> look at the scenery yeah maybe we maybe sleep to. I don't know <laughs> we can't do that just stay up drinking beer. <laughs> Part of the problem is my Achilles would be destroyed when I tried to hike and mm -hmm. then carrying it. That's also the at Brush Mountain Lodge, so I've been here two days now, pretty much to the hour. Um, I've been having real decisions about what to do. So a load of us decided maybe we go touring, um, as soon as the route's so bad. But then the pass is kind of drying now. Um, I just don't want to not finish, so I've decided I'm probably going to give it a crack. See if I can do if I, if I can do 150 miles a day for the next seven, seven eight days. I can still do a 17 day finish time, so I think I've got to just crack on and otherwise I'll just beat myself up about not finishing.
I was just kind of struggling to kind of enjoy being there a lot of the time. Um, I think I was just intimidated by the whole thing. But once I kind of got that out of my head, it was fine, and I just motored on, and then I didn't want to stop. I spent the best part of two weeks hating it and not wanting to be there, and then the last three days I didn't want to be anywhere else. There's no one bit of the divide which is brutally hard. It's not a hard bike ride. If you were to do a 50 mile ride on any section of that race, it wouldn't be absolutely brutal. However, just the accumulation of all of it, that's what really gets you. Yesterday. Continual, you're fighting the altitude, you're fighting the cold, you're fighting the heat, you're fighting the weather, you're fighting the exposure, you're fighting the la lack of supplies, and then you're riding your bike all day and not sleeping. So that's that's what grinds you down, it just grinds you down over time. at the top on the no illusion how lucky I've been with the, uh, the snow yeah, the guys in the front there they've had to, to push so once again fair play to you guys So what's your morning uh, wake up routine then? Egg and muffin. Double 
espresso. And a five hour energy. Mixed into the catch right. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. I'm just a marshal's pass now. Out of Salida. So three of us uh, stayed together last night. The brutal day in the headwinds, we were pretty beat. Sat down, I got some food, and decided to have an early night and split a hotel room. That's how I cope with it. Just go back to normality and pretend it never happened and everyone asks you about it and you can't really answer any questions because you can't, you don't really know. It takes time, it doesn't just process instantly. It takes a long time. It's such a massive thing. I mean, some people don't see that much in their whole lives. And there you see it in kind of, some people don't see that much stuff, see that much country, see that much culture and terrain and experience so many conditions or do so much exercise in their lives and you do all of this in two weeks. It's mad really, isn't it? Great day for a cycle! that but just at the summit here in the end pass highest point in the race
just about to enter New Mexico. The final state. I was getting frustrated riding with the guys. You know, they're really great to ride with, but I was starting to feel like I was stronger. And I was really starting to get frustrated by it. But I didn't want to leave them because we kind of, you know, were being, you know, riding together and we're not together, but, you know, in each other's company. And I felt bad that we was going to, you know, bugger off. But I wanted to. <laughs> together most of that day. Um, Evan would drop off a bit and then he'd catch us and we, we, we just kind of rode together or you know not always together but within a few miles of each other most of the time and then we ended up staying in Abakui to do, together and we got in about 1 or 2 a.m. so that was a kind of a 24-hour day. That was long and then the shop doesn't open till 6 a.m. so we had to wait till 6. So I think I was just I remember going, we were, we were at the door when we were, me, me and Kai set up early and um, Evan was kind of, he was really suffering with his health. Me and Kai really had the bit between our teeth by then. So we, we kind of got, we were at the, the, the store, early doors and, and Stefano caught us there as well. So we were all in the, in the, in the, in the gas station together. And I was like, right, I need to get some food in quick and I'm going to get out of here, I'm going to start racing. That's when it clicked for me. The day before I was getting frustrated, but we were kind of riding together and I kept kind of riding away a bit and then they catch me and then I drift off again and then they catch me again. And it kind of, we to toed and froed, but I was getting frustrated. I was starting to get frustrated about waiting. And that's when the, uh, the switch kind of happened that day. The switch from surviving the divide to thriving the divide and really wanting to be there and push hard. So that next morning I got my food, I got some pasta, uh, I got a few burritos for the day and I knew I had to get to Cuba. Um, so I just, yeah, fueled up and I put my head down and I started riding hard.
this long road section. I just couldn't stay awake. I was just I was weaving everywhere, so I had to stop. I don't know. Three and a half, four hours sleep. <clears throat> I'm some wine. I'm hoping a good meal in Grants. You know, you build it up in your head, you build up everything you've heard, all the hard parts and the, I guess the horror stories. I guess it's human nature to focus on what, you know, the hard parts, the negatives, it's yourself trying to, you know, you're trying to protect yourself, aren't you? You know, you're, you're, you are fighting a living thing or taking on a living thing and you know, I learned down the court throughout the course of the race that actually you kind of you're at the mercy of the divide because of the weather and the altitude. You know, all these factors they they, they always fight against you. So you you, you can kind of never really totally beat the divide but you can finish it and you can get down there. And that was a, a big factor that I learned. And, um, you know, I realized kind of, I spent a lot of the time on the race kind of being scared of it. And you kind of get scared of, you know, the big passes coming up and you think, oh, wow, it's going to be high altitude and I'm going to struggle here and it's going to be tough. And you build it up in your head and then you get there and it's fine. Um, well, not fine, but it's, it's not as bad as it seems. So I think, you know, I've, I've taken on the beast now and I survived it. Now I can, if I go back, I can try and fight back to it. The last day, the last sunrise. Feeling uh, pretty good actually. And then I woke up. I think we had two hours, and then Kai looked really tired, and I, I had a bit between my teeth. I kind of tapped into my reserves, and I just dropped Kai on the first climb, and I just got the bit between my teeth and put my head down and just felt really strong, I don't know why, it's bizarre. You know, I was almost over it, I'd almost, almost beaten the divide, I'd almost kind of conquered it. And um, yeah, so I just put my head down and then loaded up and that was that, across the desert to the finish. Can't believe it really, it's nearly over. It's not the beach there, it's still, it's still very hot. It's like being blown by hair dryer. Get my head down and get it done. I know I wasted a lot of time in the rest of the race. I just couldn't get my head into it to start with and I wasted time, I stopped early, I made excuses, I stayed in hotel rooms and that's not how you do a fast time on the divide. And 
I know what I can do now, that's the thing. You know, I, I made my mistakes, I've got my regrets. There's lots of what ifs, you know, what if I just carried my bike through the mud? What if I just pushed on? What if this, what if that, what if the other? But there's nothing I can do about it now. I can only go back and try again. Just about to enter the finish, finish straight to the border checkpoint, Antelope Wells. 46 miles to go. Just gotta get this thing done. It's tough. You know, I think back of it and I can't really tell you what I was thinking about. It's like, it's blanked out almost. I, don't, I couldn't honestly tell you. I don't know. I don't know where time goes. You know, maybe I just don't have conscious thought for certain amounts of time, I don't know. I, it's hard to process. It's taken a long time to process it. A long, long time. And I don't think I really have processed it. I guess it's almost like a trauma. I don't honestly know. But then I know I struggled when I got home. I wasn't myself for a few weeks, I know that for sure. <laughs> 